would like to read scripture for us from the ESV. Um, please put your name next to the Sunday that you're available. Jeremiah chapter 39. You don't have to. I want to. Okay, right. You see, it's difficult. <laughs> That's between you and your son. We don't need to know. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in this city. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the little gate. Nergalzar Ezer of Zagmar, Nebuchadnezzar Siki, and the Rab Saris, Nergalzar Ezer, the Rabma, with all the rest of the officers of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, they fled, going out of the city at night by the way of the king's gate, <laughs> through the gate between the two walls, and went and they went toward the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Ribal, Rib, Ribla, in the land of Ammon, and passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Ribla before his eyes, and the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him in chains, and took him to Babylon. The Chaldeans burned the king's house, and the house of the people, and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried into exile the Babylonian to Babylon, the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him, and the people who remained, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Neb Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, look after him well, and do not do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. So Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, Nerbuzadon, the Rab of Saris, Nergal of Sarizar, the Rabba, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon, sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. They entrusted him to, to Gedaliah, the son of Akia, son of Shephan, that he should take him home. So he lived among the people. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my word against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hands of the enemy of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put the trust in me, declares the Lord. This is the word of God. Now the Lord bless the reading of this word. Let us now come before our God with prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you call us together to worship you and that you have given us. The Holy Spirit, that we may lean upon Him, that we may hear His voice, that He may prompt us to come and heed the call. We pray, O Lord, that You would now meet with us by Your Holy Spirit, as indeed You have met with us and are meeting with us at this time. We pray that You may continue with us. O Lord, we wish to take no step forward. You are not with us like Moses of old. Express that, O oh Lord, without you, we dare not go any further. Father, so be with us. 
comfort us. May the comforting rod and staff of our shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be with us. May we look to him. May we see that, that he is the one carrying the instruments for the benefit of the sheep. Father, we thank you that we may come this morning also to a table that has been prepared for us by Christ. Not only in the physical elements of the bread and the wine, but also, O oh Lord, from your word, especially from your word. For, O oh Lord, without your life-giving and life-sustaining word, the bread only remains bread and the wine only remains wine. But when we hope with the eyes of faith, not with magic, O oh Lord, but with the eyes of faith to our Lord Jesus Christ, we are reminded of his effectual death on the cross, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us. We confess, O oh Lord, that it is you who bought the church with your own blood. Even as we have seen this morning, read in our hearing, oh Lord, we want to stop our eyes because we pretend like we hate violence while we, in our world, watch so many <coughs> movies and hear so many things about violence. Your word is not pretentious. It speaks about the violence of men openly. Just as the captives of your people brought to Babylon with their eyes poked out, so Jesus Christ also declared, it is better for us as captives to go into the kingdom of heaven without an eye or a limb than to not enter that kingdom at all. And so far that we understand the picture here glory of the Babylonian kingdom will not be seen by the kings of Israel who was faithless. For you would have clothed your people Israel with all of the riches, and you have clothed them with all of the riches of the kingdom of Egypt. And more than that, when King Solomon reigned, but your people were faithless. Father, and as Paul applies these things to the church, as he calls us like he called the Corinthian church to repent of idolatry, to repent of immorality, to repent of arrogance, pride, lust, covetousness. May we repent of those things, O oh Lord. May our repentance be swift. May we learn to quickly run to Jesus. And Father, when we have no legs to run, we pray that we would crawl with our arms. And if we have no arms, that we would roll. But, oh Lord, anything, any movement, just even a cry like the Father in Mark chapter 9, which cried, oh Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Father, this is how desperate we are to enter into that kingdom to enter by the narrow gate and thus upright in pray. Father, we thank you. With springtime comes a new busy season. We thank you that we are able to clean up our houses, to have the dust of the winter settling, and for the rain season to come. We pray that you would pour out rain upon your people according to your measure, O oh Lord. Let us not be faithless in moaning about too much or too little rain. You are a good and sovereign Lord, knowing upon whom you send your rains at the right time. Let ours not be a question of timing, of when will this and when will that, and when will the Lord do this, but let us be awaiting people, waiting upon you. Patiently saying, come, Lord Jesus. Not as a cry of desperation for an alleviation from our suffering, but as a true desire of our heart to see more of your kingdom coming 
as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. Oh Lord, let us be ready to do your will. Father, we also pray then that we would be more faithful in prayer. Drag us, O Lord, by your Holy Spirit, kicking and screaming to our closet to pray, to our inner room to pray. Father, with the men who have to keep their hands busy, we know that you call them to pray, lifting up holy hands, and you say to them, in other words, that they must pray while they work, and not think that there's a time for work and there's a time for prayer, but there is a time to work and pray. Pray and work. Let us be doing your work and not our own. For we have received the call of Christ so many times from this pulpit before. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you for that promise of Christ who will give us that rest. To receive that rest, O Lord, Christ has told us, take my yoke upon you. So may each and every Christian sitting here this morning take the yoke of Christ upon their shoulders. Make us strong to pull the weight which you have called us to pull. No, Father, the weight that we pull is a weight that is a weight of the gift of grace. You don't weigh us down with unnecessary things, not with material things, but you weigh us down. It's not even a weighing down. It is a pouring out of blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And if we can carry the weight of those blessings with responsibility, oh Lord, thank you for giving us more and more and more blessing. Great grace, we know, comes great responsibility, oh Lord. For we would lose, we would want to lose none of your graces. As you have called each man to be a man before you, we pray that he may stand before you. Carry that grace of being a man. May every woman that stand before you, or kneel before you, work before you, may she receive the grace to be a godly one. May they also receive the grace, O Lord, of being godly husbands and wives. Where we have received the gift of parenting, we thank you, O Lord, for making us godly fathers and mothers. And we be faithful. Test us, O Lord, know our hearts. As we come before you like King David came before you in Psalm 139, search me, O Lord, and know me. I am before you always. Declare to me if there is any way that is blameworthy before you, so that you may root out the sin, deliver me from its power so that I may stand with a clear conscience, so that we may stand with a clear conscience before you. Now, Father, as we approach this morning, the elements which you distribute to us, may we approach it with reverence and fear, with a sincere faith. A sincere faith. O oh Lord, however little that faith may be, may it be sincere. For, O oh Lord, just like the price of one thing may be gold, no matter the quantity, the price still remains in gold. So we ask, O oh Lord, as we approach in faith, that faith will be faith. You do not ask us, show me the quantity of your faith, show me the genuineness of your faith. So, O oh Lord, we pray, refine us, refine us. Like gold is refined, and we know, like Peter, who wrote, it will not be easy because to go through a refining process means that we experience heat and friction, difficulty, tribulation, trial to prove the genuineness of our faith. But, O oh Lord, let the genuineness of our faith be proven. Because only then we will be assured that we truly have faith, assured that we truly have salvation. Assured that we will truly enter the kingdom. So, Lord, there is no shame in asking increase our faith. Increase our faith, O oh Lord. Give us more and more of the true and pure and genuine faith from your word. 
work this faith in us by the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for the churches around us. We pray for Floodview Baptist Church. We thank you for Pastor Tians and the work that they are doing there. We thank you for the marriage course that they have taught the past couple of Saturdays. We thank you for the people who have attended. We thank you for their growth. We pray that they may continue before you. Father, we thank you for Bethany, for Pastor Jonathan, for Pastor in Training, Kuziba. We pray for them that you continue to strive with them and work with them, that their light may shine in Centurion, Littleton area, as they serve the saints. We pray for Constantia Park Baptist Church. We thank you for the rest, pastoral leave of Pastor Willem, that he was able to spend some time with his family. We pray for the congregation there, O oh Lord, as we have received news from them, that they are continuing to look to the Lord, establish and grow their church. May you continue to strive with the people in Pretoria East. Father, we pray for our own congregation as we move about. We pray that we would be faithful in shining the light of Christ as we meet new people, as we smile, as we friendly greet them with a friendly face, as we show them a little bit of the kindness and gentleness of Christ that rubs off on us. We do not want to be hard of heart where the kindness and gentleness and love of Christ does not rub off on us. Soften our hearts, O Lord, even as we now prepare to receive your word. Father, we also ask for those in our congregation, those who visit with us, those who come in and out. You know their situation, you know their needs. We've had many single mothers, single fathers, Young children, young teenagers, young men, young women coming in and out of this congregation, receiving a little bit of sustenance from your word. We see their encouragement, but we pray, O oh Lord, that they may return, or that they may find a place where your word is being taught, where your word is being fed to them, that they may eat, that they may grow, and that they may become sturdy, heavy. No pushover Christians. We pray this for all of us, O oh Lord, that we may be spiritually mature. We ask that you forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, for to you belong the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forevermore. And now we get to extend that confession. As we sing together, O oh Lord, crown him with many crowns, we pray, crown our Lord Jesus with many crowns. For all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, and every king that lays down the crown is worthy to wear them all. Be with us as we confess, as we sing, and let it issue out from us with a pure heart and a clean conscience before you. Amen. 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 Let us now stand and sing to the crown in the of mount. Now, please. 
our text this morning, I just want us to notice also that though we reverently approach the Lord's table, though we caution and warn and say many things uh, about the dangers, we need to say something about the great joy. We need to say something about the, the weightiness of that joy. That's why we approach it reverently. Because we don't approach it like a party on a Friday evening. We don't approach it like a bride on a Saturday. You know? I hear some people say, you know, Sunday church, it was lacquer. It was nice. Lacquer and nice are not holy and reverent in that sense. It doesn't carry the same weight. You know, my friends are nice people. But that doesn't tell me everything about your nice friends. The bride phrase was lacquer. Now, if the church, if you tell people, well, church was nice or lacquer, I always want a clarifying question. You mean like when you bride on Friday? You mean like when you went to your friend's house on Wednesday? That was a nice visit. Was church nice on the same level? Was church lacquer on the same level as that? And they said, no, 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 no. I mean, and then we, we lost the descriptiveness of what it means to come to church. We forget words like, that was encouraging. That was eye-opening. That was weighty. That made me think. Tell me, what did you think about it? Tell me what was so encouraging. Tell me what was so weighty. Because when people ask, what made it nice? Oh, it was just nice. Oh, it was just like, you know, like it was like, nice is nice. What damage does it do to your evangelism if you talk about church in that way? What damage does it do to the light that you're called to shine wherever we go? Because you're called to shine your light before men. And is that the light you're shining? What church is it? Nice. 
You know, it's like that little flashlight with the pop battery. The flat battery. I have one in my room. I try and light something with it. You can't see anything with it. The church was nice. It's like that little flashlight. You can't see anything within the dark. The church was lacquer. It was nice. Well, if you say church was weighty. Church was encouraging. You're shining a bit brighter light. And then I say, oh, whoa. I'm not used to Christians talking about that. What's going on here? Let me, let my eyes adapt. Let me just ask you, what do you mean? What was so encouraging? What was so weighty? Just think about the words you use to describe church. Because I think this is what Paul is writing to the Corinthian church throughout this whole letter. What do you talk about when you talk about church? Do you talk about, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas. I am of Jesus, I am of that one, I am of that one, I like this one, I like Bodhi and the three other men who doesn't have their photo up, we couldn't care less. Why are we here? Is it for Bodhi or the three names? Or the pastor? Or the this or the that? Why are you here anyway? Corinthian church, why are you all here? Well, Paul knows the answer why all of the Corinthians are there, and we know the answer why we're here. Paul said, God told him, I have many people in this place. Now, does God have many people in Rene's cross? Does he have many people in this place? Well, the evidence is sitting right before me. For the past three years, I've been ministering from this book, and not once the church has been completely empty. Not once. We had Sunday morning services and evening services since I got here. We didn't have to cancel one of them because we had two little people. We were one six in an evening service. We had the full service. It's not like that joke about the old woman who's the only one coming to church on the Sunday and the pastor opens the gate for him and he walks in and he says, Pastor, it looks like it's just you and me. And then the pastor says, Yeah, well, looks like you can go home with me. And the old man, old man tells him, You know, Pastor, when I go to the chickens, and only one rooster shows up to eat the pits. I still give him some pits to eat. Then the pastor says, well, strap in. He goes through the whole liturgy. Call to worship. The answer to the call. Singing all of the hymns. Preaching the full sermon. And then he goes to greet the old woman. He says, oh, well, well, was that enough food for you? He says, Pastor, when that one rooster shows up, I don't dump the whole bucket of pits on him. <laughs> Someone once thinks that's true. It's true. That, more, that tiny rooster cannot eat all of those pits. Okay? If the old me alone shows up, you feed his soul with the word. When three more show up, you feed the four souls. When there's six in church, you feed the six souls. When there's a hundred in church, you feed a hundred souls. Because feeding souls remain the same. Feeding souls. I have a very lovely book by a reformed reformer, which you don't know, Martin Bootser. Does anyone have the name of it? The book is called Concerning the True Care of Souls. It's like a thick manual like that. It looks exactly like the thick manual my dad had was, was a sheep farmer. And that book was called Fear Sickness in Roman de Genees. What's it in English? Help the English people. What? Remedies for the flock or something like that. Sickness, illnesses and diseases of the flock. 
how to feed them, how to care for them, how to diagnose their illnesses, how to see what they have. Now, what is the manual? Where did Martin Luther come up with that title? And what, did, where, what, what, what does he write about concerning the true care of souls? Well, he studied his Bible. He said, what does the Bible have to say to a pastor about caring for souls? Then he says, I wonder if they have some, yes, maybe. Let me just make a note because I think that, yeah, Lord, just like that over there. And he goes, oh, yes. And he started writing and thinking about the text. What does the Bible have to say to you about caring for souls, pastor? And he wrote it down in a book. Then he has to present the information. Caring for souls, caring for sheep. There are a couple of principles. One of the things is know what they eat. Because if they eat the wrong thing, what do they do? They die. They die. They die. They die. They die. We go through this. When they eat the wrong thing, they die. When they eat something new that's good, even if they're not used to it, what happens? They die. You can't, you can't just change their diet immediately. You have to wean them off what they've been used to and give them something better instead. And then you take the kernels away and you feed them this good stuff. And then there's more good stuff to come by the grace of God because that's not all they get to eat. Because their diet needs to change. If I stay on the same diet as my son, what's going to happen to me? You can already feel my ribs. You'll get to see them through the shirt, which is not my, my fault. I almost caused marriage problems last Sunday. Because of not ironing the shirt. You see, the, the sheep need a consistent diet to nurture their faith. Because that's what we come to church for, is to feed our souls, to nurture faith so that faith may grow. Faith, in this sense, is not a force. It's like a rope. It's like a rope. If you have a faith Filled with lots of knowledge. You have a very, very thick rope. Then you try and tie that thick rope to the wrong object. If you don't believe in the true Christ, what happens with that rope? You tie it against a twig. What's going to happen when you think of tying your boat with that rope to that twig? What's going to happen? The twig is going to snap and your boat's going to drift. Right? Now, you have a very, very good understanding of that pole that is thick. And you know that that pole is planted solidly in the ground. The whole earth's weight concentrated on that one pole. You won't easily budge. You can even try with a tractor like we did on the farm once with a pole that my opa planted when, when, when cement was cheap. <laughs> the tractor goes boom, boom, and digs itself a ground in because it cannot pull out that pole. And you tie a little thin rope to it. Just thin enough to hold the weight of the boat. Just accounting for the weight of the water moving. Just accounting for that. And you tie that little piece to that. Is your boat going to drift away? When the waves hit against the boat, what's the boat going to do? Drift away. It's just going to bobble up in there. Little bit of faith. Little bit of faith. But tied to the right object. A lot of faith and a lot of things tied to the wrong object. He has a strong faith. Wow, that man is strong in faith. Might be true. He might have a very strong faith, but he has a very strong faith in his own ability to work. He has a very strong faith in his own 
mind to solve the problems of the world. Strong faith. It's not what we need. We don't need more strong believing people. We have strong believing people because we have so many people with strongly held beliefs. You all sitting here have strongly held beliefs. And how many people do you encounter? You say you have strongly held beliefs. Isn't this the excuse in every debate? Why would I have strongly held beliefs? Because they have strong ropes tying themselves to these beliefs. The question is not about the strong or the weak of the belief of the faith, of the rope. The question is what is it tied to? What is it tied to? Because this is what Paul is arguing for in verse Corinthians 10. What is it tied to? You all have strongly held beliefs, Corinthians. Just like all our fathers were under the cloud, went through the sea, experienced all of the graces of God in the wilderness, in leading them out of Egypt, leading them into the promised land. All of these things you've experienced, you've seen, you have strongly held beliefs because you've experienced these things. But you see in verse 6, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. You see? Your thick faith tied to a tiny little post. But your desires, the boat wanting to go onto the water, is pulling so strong that it's not anchored to the shore anymore. It's written for our instruction. It's given for us as an example that we might. What is this might? Giving us the possibility. It's possible for you to evaluate yourself, brother and sister. Beloved, evaluate. Do I have a strong desire for evil? Stronger desire for evil? Or do I have a strong desire for the Lord? Because people with a strong desire for evil will pretend that they have the thickest rope and tie it to a twig. And people with a strong desire for evil will look at that solid twig, solid hole in the ground, and say, I'll hold on to it with my hand. Or I'll turn, tie a thin thread. Because I know the weight of my boat and I know the desire is the strength of the pull of your evil desire stronger than the pull that you tie yourself with to that pole. Because if the pull is stronger than the, the, the faith here, that's why you cultivate faith. That's why you cultivate faith. So that the stronger desires don't grab hold of you and drag you away. This is what Paul is warning them against. Make sure that when the storms come, your boat is tied. Don't desire evil. Don't be desirous of evil as they were. Don't desire it as they will. were. Listen to the things that they desired. Verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. You see, they were idolaters. We'd rather serve a golden calf than serve the true and living God. Verse 8. We must not indulge in immorality as some of them did. You know, their desire for sex is more than their desire for a holy life with God. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did. You see, what a test. Give us food, give us water. Give us food, give us, give us material blessings. We don't really want your presence. We want the food and the water and we want it on that. Sabbath day when we're not supposed to go out. And we'll do anything other than what God had told us and instructed us to do because we don't trust Him. We trust ourselves. I'll go and collect on Saturday. Sabbath day. Which God had said, don't do to the Israelites. And they went and collected. 
And then when God told them, don't collect for the next day because I'll provide for the next day. What did they do? They took more and they kept till the next day. What happened with that food that they collected for the next day? It rot. It rotted. Isn't that much like the rich man that Jesus speaks of in the parable? He builds his barn. And all this material stuff got in there. Just like the man with the many cars. Jed, remember him? He, he puts his cars along with the money in there. What, what does the parable say? When he dies, what happens? That barn is so full, the door just bursts open. And to who does this stuff belong to them? Go and read the parable. I, I can't make it too easy. Verse 10. Do not grumble as some of them did. You see, some of them grumble. The Afrikaans expression is kilometer, but it grows only up. He moans while he's carrying the white bread under the, the white loaf under the arm. He's got what, he's, what he needs. You have more than you need for today. More than you need for today. Do you go about grumbling? So far, but you know, in the olden days, it wasn't this far. You know? Yeah, they didn't have cell phones, which made it easy for them. But you know, still, today is harder than that. If you look at what we have and the tools that we have today, if someone from the 16th century would look at us moaning about what we have, they'd say, Whoa, what are you moaning about? With your car, with your money, with your house, with your with all these things. Why are you moaning? Corinthian church, why are you grumbling? We shouldn't be grumbling. Look at the result. Verse 6 to 9. Look at the result of these desires. Look at the results of these desires. Note very well. Not all of them had these desires. Some of them had this desire, some of them that, some of them that, some of them. They're not even unified in the things that they desire. You have someone desiring money, you have someone desiring that, someone desiring five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten desires. And we can even split the room up if I'm going to ask you which one is your strongest desire. We'd be able to split in little groups about which desires you desire most. You see, there can be no unity when my desire is first. And when you mix only with people who have the same desires as you. Because that's not true unity. Unity is not built on unified desires. Listen very carefully. You could write that down because I have to say this three, four, five, six, seven times. <clears throat> unity in the church is not built upon unified desires. Plural. Because those are the desires you come up with. Unity is built on the desire that God puts in. One. Singular. And that desire must be the strongest thing in you. If there are other desires that are stronger, that will not unify us. There is only one thing that unifies us in the church, and that is a very strong, 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 strong desire. <laughs> For Christ. Who works that desire in you? Because you can't muster it out yourself. God's call is irresistible. God's call is irresistible. I can only say yes. I can only submit. It's like the magnet, the big magnet saying, come here little magnet. And the little magnet says, I'm still out of your reach. You can't reach me. You know, the magnetic field. You ever play with magnets? Okay. When that little magnet enters the magnetic field, does it pull the big magnet to itself? Come on, scientists. Which one pulls which one closer? The desire of Christ pulls us closer. But then you have to move inside his magnetic field. 
What's his magnetic field? The Word. The Word. Where the Holy Spirit can reach your ear with His Word. Spoken or written? Spoken. Romans 10. Romans 10. How will they believe if they do not see it with their own eyes? Hear it with their own ears. That's what the text tells us. Romans 10. How will they believe if they do not hear it? You see, I'll believe it when I see it. Your problem is not your eyes. Your problem is your ears, people. You're going to the... What's the ear doctor called? Audiologist. Rather than the... You're going to the optometrist, but you should be going to the audiologist. You're coming to Jesus and saying, I'm blind. Heal my eyes. And he tells you, open them up and you say, I'm blind. Because you can't hear him telling you, open your eyes. He goes, he takes the stuff out of your ear and he says, open your eyes. And you say, oh, I can see. A good doctor knows how to diagnose the right problems. And Jesus is the best of best doctors. He knows exactly what souls need. And so you have to come to Jesus, just like modern boots that tells pastor to come to Jesus to know what the sheep need. To know what your own soul needs, to know what the sheep need. Let's see the result. In verse 7, we see the people sat down and drank and rose to play. I'm not going to turn there again, but that phrase comes from Exodus when they built the golden calf. Go read the narrative yourself. I'll preach on it, but you have to read your Bible. I'll preach on the text, I'll give you the details, but you have to go read your Bible to know what I'm talking about. In Exodus, the golden calf incident, you don't even need to know the chapter, just page through Exodus and you'll see the golden calf incident in your ESV. Title of the section you need to read. It's easy. What happened there? The people were impatient because Moses was busy with God for 40 days where God instructed Moses what he should eat. He's telling the people. And they voted him in to do that. Remember, when God spoke the law, the people said, let someone else speak to God, but let him not speak to us because we'll die, Exodus 20. And so Moses is the one who gets to speak to God, and then he gets to tell them what God, and when they don't hear, when they're outside of God's magnetic field, because that's actually what they want, you see, we don't want God to speak to us, because then we need to do these things, and we really don't want to, we want to, they say we want to out of fear, out of fear. We shouldn't commit to serve the Lord because we fear in that sort of way. Fear what will happen to us. We come to the Lord not because He threatens us, we come to the Lord because His magnetic field holds us. Why? Yes, it will be fearful before you're in that magnetic field, before the desires are strong enough to pull you, because when you're outside of that magnetic field there, you're under as well. That's what people feel when they don't feel the love and the desire. Of God for them. They feel the wrath. They feel the wrath. When you're far from Jesus. Because his wrath. Remains on those. Far from him. That's why it's frightening. That's why the Israelites tremble. Because we feel his wrath. And his voice when he says. You shall not. You shall not. You shall not. And they say. I have already. What now? Stand his voice, I'm going to die. You see, they didn't even see his face, they only heard his voice. And they trembled like that. Alright? The people sat down, ate and drank, and rose up to play. They were so relieved. Thank goodness. We now have a golden calf. We can serve the true God. There he is. We can see him. He's not speaking to us anymore. We see him. We don't hear him. We just see him. Now we can party. 
Now with the party, that's what they did. They were, and then God said to Moses, what are the people doing? Moses said, well, I, I don't know. Let me go find out. Because God knows what's going on. Moses doesn't. Just like the pastor doesn't know everyone's problems, but God does. God knows everyone's problems. I don't need, God will tell me, go and speak to that. Okay. I'll have a look. I'll speak. That's why we have certain ways of doing things at church. Like a membership application form. Like, if you need help, ask the pastor because I can't read it on your face. I can't read it on your face. I don't know it. But if you know the God that knows everything, that God will make known to you the things you need to know. Through prayer. Through doing your work diligently. And Moses was doing his work. And God revealed to him. That's what the people are doing. And then, he goes downstairs. Some of the text says, it's how you remember the stuff. He goes down, because he's on top of the mountain. I'm not saying the Bible says Moses goes down the stairs. I'm telling you that so that you remember the flow. He goes downstairs. He goes down the mountain. He sees what they're doing. And the joke goes, Moses then broke all the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Moses broke them because they broke them. What use is this? Because this is the contract God is setting up with his people. Which he's going to sign with his own blood. But before he even put his blood to sign that contract, they broke it already. Like the husband who prepares the marriage contract. He prepares the marriage contract and then he goes to the bride and says, prepare a nice cock. And then he sees her doing something that he doesn't want. Don't you think that's how God must have felt looking at Israel? Isn't that exactly why he stopped the contract writing process? Because I have to warm up because I need to write this contract not from hatred but from love. Because the commandments are not legalistic commandments. They're commandments to love. You see, not even God approaches His law from a place of lovelessness. We approach God's law from a place of lovelessness. That's legalism. That is legalism. God's law is not legalism. Be with churches. When you ask pastors, why aren't you reading God's law anymore? Why are you not reading God's law anymore in your churches? Why aren't you reading the Ten Commandments? Because the people don't change us. Well, that's not what's there. The law of God is not in your bread in your churches so that people they must conform to it. That's not why you read the law of God. But just because the people does not change doesn't mean you don't read it. doesn't mean you don't read it anymore. Because to shut the law out is to say, I don't want to hear about God's love. Even that wrathful, vengeful, bully, all the testament God. Haven't I now shown you the love of the Old Testament God? Isn't Paul appealing to exactly that when he writes to the Corinthians? Appealing to the love of the Old Testament God. Because it's the same God. The old and the new. It's the same God. Old and New Testament. Same God. Same love. It's the Old Testament God that loved the world so much that He gave His only Son. Because they broke the law again and again and again. And God has to go and say, I have to clean it up, clean it up, clean it up. But I have to sign it in my blood, so I have to cover all of it. I'll have to cover all of it with the blood of Jesus. All of it.
Jesus has enough, enough blood to clean up. Isn't that what we confess? Because his blood was shed for us and it's continually flowing and pouring and spiritually, I'm saying. Hear me, spiritually. Not in the elements, you hear? Don't idolize the elements. Don't idolize the tumble here. It serves as a reminder. You're not crippled in your faith if you miss this one Sunday. You're crippled in your faith when you don't hear Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Just as like you don't skip a meal without eating double as much the next meal. So you can't skip your spiritual nourishment and not eat double as much the next time. Otherwise you starve. Like I'm starving right now when you eat lunch. <laughs> you see? We're starving. We're starving. And what do you feed a starving person? I was starving in the week. I went, I, I was caught at lunchtime in the shops. And what do people eat at lunchtime in the shops? I go to King Park <laughs> and I stand in line. And there's 30 people in front of me, it's lunchtime. Lord, this line is long. <laughs> okay, and then I say, no, King Pie is not worth this way. I go past, it was mug and bean. Tables are full. I say to the waitress, how long does it take to get a sandwich? It's lunchtime. You might wait an hour. <laughs> I say, well, to, about that time, I'll be, I, I, I won't be hungry because I, I would have been eating myself already. <laughs> Then you go into the wimpy at lunchtime because no one eats wimpy at lunchtime. You only eat breakfast at lunchtime. But the great thing about their breakfast is they serve it all day. I go to the wimpy, there's only two people sitting in that whole wimpy. Only two tables out of a place that has 50, 60 tables. How quick is your kitchen? I ask the waitress. She tells me, top speed. <laughs> It's stop speed. Why? Because there's no one else ordering food at that time. They're all waiting at the ready to prepare it, give it out. I say that's great. I read the menu like a kid because I'm reading with my stomach and not my eyes. That one looks good. That's not breakfast, he says. I says, well, it has an egg. It's breakfast. Give it to me. <laughs> because it has steak and chips. I'm starving. I need chips and steak and egg, all of it. I know it's the most expensive thing on the menu. Because I'm starving. You see, that's the kind of desperation. That's the kind of desperation you need. Because a starving person will not say no to a fool. That a woman who wants to just have a handful of peace, he's not starving because he had his meal last Sunday. Now you can think to yourself, when you're a mature Christian, when you're a mature Christian, the principle applies. If you miss one Sunday, you don't feel guilty. But if you're a chronic stayer away, like one pastor called it, the chronic stayer away, that's one of those spiritual diseases. Chronic or stayer away. Chronic, chronic meaning long term stay away and it's not coming anymore to church. He hits less than he misses. He misses more than he hits. Okay? If you hit more than you miss, you feel too guilty. It would still be better if you were to come, but life, life, it's not life that happens. It's the good Lord having something different for you that day. Because we assume you're busy with some work of mercy, some work of grace, you're with your family, you're busy, you're busy doing something for the Lord. And out of the text, you can see the application is far and wide. Because it's the root problem 
It's the same in Corinth. It's the same problem in the Old Testament. It's the same problem today. You see, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And man's problem is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's why Jesus remains the right answer yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's why the Sunday school answer is so great. Because no matter the question, who's the solution? Jesus. Is. Yeah? You see? And, and the solution of Jesus is not just one solution among many. It's like the person who's sick, who needs the pharmacy. Because inside the pharmacy, there's aspirin. What is the speed for sluggers? Anyway, the muscle relaxant, stomach medicine, hair, medicine to make your hair grow, medicine to make your hair stop growing, medicine, 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 medicine. I'm not saying Jesus is a pharmacy, okay? I'm saying it's like, it's a, think of it like this. Jesus is not like one of the options for your soul. He is the option. Just if you rush someone to the hospital who's in need. And just like you as a healthy person goes to the hospital to visit the sick. And just like you as a healthy person go to the hospital to visit the doctor for a yearly checkup. Or a five yearly checkup. You just do these things. You go to Jesus when he calls you. And what a wonderful privilege it is this, this day that he calls us to his table to remember the spiritual truths behind the physical elements that you're going to partake. And I want to say this last thing to conclude this sermon. We need to understand that these two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, were instituted by the same Lord, by Christ. In both of these, we approach Him. In the one who approach Him alone as an individual, I believe. First Peter 3, with a clean conscience, I appeal to the Lord myself, my conscience, clean before the Lord. I'm going to partake of this ordinance. With witnesses, of course, the whole church is praying for you that that conscience is clean. That's why you go through baptism alone and that we don't just have you sit and watch everyone go through baptism. You go through the baptism or we sit and watch you get wet. But with the Lord's Supper, we all come together. Now, is the faith you need for baptism and the faith you need for here the same or different? The same faith. The same faith. The faith, same faith you need to approach both of them. Because it's only by that same faith that you approach the one Lord Jesus Christ, either alone or together with the whole congregation. And that's why we invite you. That's why you're invited. You appeal to the Lord from a good conscience, with sincere faith, sincere faith, you're in not a huge faith, but a sincere faith. To take it with us. Take it together with confidence, not in our faith, but confidence in our role. Confidence in Christ. May we approach Him with confidence as He is gracious. Amen. Let us now stand and sing. Be thou my vision, and then we bring a table to the room. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision. Be
Thank you for sleeping thy presence, my life. Give thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, by thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Be thou my battle shield, sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, thou my might out. Praise thou me, Hembert, O power of my power. Reaches I need not, no man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always, Thou and Thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. I reach As we approach the Lord's Supper, we normally read from Hebrews chapter 10. But I want you to notice the context here, because we're reading from verse 19, and you, you would know that verse chapter 11 is that great chapter by the men of faith, and also the women of faith. And then you see in, verse, in chapter 12, verse 1, we see the, the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. And we see in chapter 13, the imitation of our leaders, imitate them, no, the text says imitate their faith, verse 7 of chapter 13, but before he even begins that chapter, because we all approach one person by faith, that's why he says in, in verse 19, therefore brothers, or brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, since we have confidence because of our faith, you see, by the new and the living way that he opened for us. See, you don't need to open a way, or you don't need to see the way, you just need to see the way. You just need to hear and point it in the right direction. The way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. You believe that Christ has come in the flesh, that he is the son of the living God, and that he paid for your sins. And sincere, Verse 21, and since, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, a great priest over the house of God, let us then draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Not a full measure of faith, but a full assurance. You can be sure of your faith, small though it may be. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. See the faithfulness of the God who provided this meal, the meal of his Son. Let's pray together to bless this communion, and then we'll distribute the elements. Our Father in heaven, our Maker, we thank you that you have made us, that you have called us. But more than that, O oh Lord, when we sinned, when we ran from you, when we dishonored you, when we sinned against you, when we displeased you, you came for us. And you came for us not with your wrath, not in your anger, but you pursued us through Christ Jesus our Lord, so that he may 
grab a hold of us. And what we thought initially might be a fight, a battle, turn out to be Him saving us from hell. Dusting us off, pointing us in the right direction, telling us, repent and believe and go that way. You'll find my Father there. Go with the Holy Spirit. Father, may we hear the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ who sends us on our way but also meets with us by the power of the Holy Spirit as He reminds us of all of your words and where you have met with people. Will you meet with us, Lord? Father, meet with us through Christ Jesus this morning as we partake of His Supper. That by the remembrance of the Holy Spirit, by His reminder through the Word, that our memory would be clear. That we would not somehow remember this as a faint memory from long ago, but that it would be a memory so vivid in our mind that Christ died for us as if it were yesterday. Thank you that he died for us 2,000 years ago and that people still carry on submitting to him and that his kingdom extends, as Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 9, to the end of his kingdom, to the expansion of his kingdom, rather, there is no end. To the increase of his government, there is no end. Thank you, Lord. We pray that we may be worthy recipients by the gift of faith that you have given to us. In the name of Christ, we come before you by his grace, by the enabling grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please take part of the elements, the bread and the cup. Everyone receive the elements. <clears throat> As Jesus and his disciples were taking the last cross over together. They were eating, Jesus took bread. After blessing the bread, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, 
is not the participation in the bread, the participation in the body of Christ. That Jesus took the cup, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's not the participation in the cup, the participation in the body of Christ. Let's pray and give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you once again that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper. We ask, Father, that you purify our hearts and minds and sanctify this cup, symbolizing the precious blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that was shed on the cross. In sharing this cup, we undeservedly share in the new covenant and the gift of eternal life. It was Jesus who said while teaching, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. As we look to Calvary, we hear Christ calling out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Son of God, who had enjoyed uninterrupted fellowship with God the Father, is bearing the sins of the world in his body on the cross. The sun is under divine judgment for the first time. Darkness covered the land of Israel as God the Father turned away from God the Son. The chief priests and scribes ridiculed the crucified Christ, saying, He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If, in, if indeed God takes pleasure in him. After he received the drink on the cross, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We Christians, holding fast to our faith, thank the Lord Jesus for his sacrifices. We remember that Jesus had told his disciples that he was going to the Father. At some undetermined time, he would return. May we grow in the great understanding of the Lord Jesus. Praise be to the Father, and the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let us now stand together and sing our closing in blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Stand and sing. Watching the waves in the kingdom of God, with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, and he must say, This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior, the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God the Father, be with us all forever. Amen. Amen. And it's now I'm not going to resist this moment. I have to say please stay for a cup of tea. Happy birthday boys for having their birthday today.